episode of this with Haber and Martinez. I'm Haber. That's Martinez. Uh, we are here to talk about some more uh, real world current and local criminal cases. Last week, we did a show and we talked uh, specifically about one case from here in Miami-Dade County. Um, we did not have the benefit of the police reports. We were operating on strictly um, news media reporting. And we were very clear when we did that to, to make sure that you guys understood how bad a practice that is. Um, and we're going to kind of clear up a little bit of the why of that, because we're going to spend the first couple minutes of this show talking about that case again, but with the benefit this time of having the uh, what we call an arrest affidavit, which is the initial police report. It is a sworn statement of facts and circumstances that the, the arresting officer uh, claims as constituting probable cause for the arrest. So it's an extremely important document. It is the what I would call, from my experience and the way that I've come to do things, it's the jumping off point from where a defense attorney should start to assess the respective strengths and weaknesses of the government's case, any potential defenses, motions that are obvious in terms of suppression or dismissal, things along those lines. So when we when we talk about cases without the benefit of that, and I'm sure Ed will back me up on this. You know, I get calls from people all the time looking to consult on cases and they want to tell me what happened. And I have to stop them and say, whoa, I don't want to hear it. I mean, not that I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it now. I want to start with what the cops have to say. Please send me your police report. Why? Because the police report, if it is in fact a lawful statement of probable cause should be your absolute worst case scenario. The four corners of that document should bury you if the cops did their job right. Now, obviously, there's there's almost always additional information, and that's when we sit down and talk to our clients and debrief them and figure out whether there's any defense witnesses or defense evidence, where we're going to start to conduct a defense investigation, or if we do see any chinks in the armor, where we're going to attack uh, the the initial assessment of probable cause in the state's case. Go ahead, Ed. I just want to add one other thing, because a lot of times Michael Wright, our clients, will be like, the cop's lying. It doesn't matter. Michael and I still need to read the A form, because even if the cop is lying, it's something we're going to have to address. It's written on the A form. So we still have to address it. We still have to be prepared. We still have to know what it is that the cop said, whether it's true or not. It doesn't matter. We need to know. And And whether or not you know, additionally, it's not even so much if the cops are lying, because a lot of times the cops only have limited information. I mean, by way of very brief example, I had a stand your ground case not that long ago where my client was arrested. He was on probation at the time. So when the cops showed up, rather than telling them what happened, he immediately said, I can't say anything without my lawyer present. So they didn't have his side of the story. So operating only on the information that they had, they made what appeared to be to the blind eye a very valid probable cause arrest. But once the other side of the story was exposed, it was obvious that this was a standard round case, which is why we ultimately got that guy immunity. The point is, these reports are extremely important. So last week, we spent a whole... The in there for, Go ahead. For, for Michael, because this Go is ahead. really for citizens. This isn't for lawyers. It's not a CLE. Why is it that that person that Michael dealt with, nothing would have changed had he told the officers his side of the story? Because the officer will tell you, if you tell them that you were de defending yourself, the officer will tell you, well, that's something for you to bring up with your lawyer in court. They're not going to not arrest simply because you say, well, let me explain to you what happened. I don't know. They're it depends. I, I mean, I would say as a general rule, we, you know, look, you know, my tagline, anybody who watches this show knows my tagline. My general starting rule is exactly what Ed said. Up X2, hashtag up X2. There's nothing you can say to the cops that your lawyer can't say both smarter and safer. Right. But I will say that there are times and there are cops that will take the time to conduct an actual investigation. In this particular case, if my client had told them his version of events, they would have corroborated that by looking at his ring doorbell video, and that would have been the end of it. That's so, different. That's different. But, again, ring... I'm saying there are circumstances. So and let me just... For everybody to know, not only is it that Michael and I know what to say, can do it better. Remember, here's the other thing I was telling my clients. 
Anything that the suspect says is a confession, good or bad. Anything Michael or I say as your lawyers is hearsay. So they can't even use it. It doesn't matter what happens. We can say whatever we want. And whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. They can't bring it in. They can't even call us as a witness because it's hearsay. So it's important to let your lawyers talk for you. So I, I just want to very quickly, I'm going to reread what we read yesterday, uh, last week. This is what we were operating off of only, nothing else. Police arrested a man Thursday who they said shot a person in Southwest Miami-Dade. According to the arrest report, the individual is facing one count of second-degree attempted murder and aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. Police responded to the shooting call at 3.30 p.m. in West Perrine. Upon arrival, they spoke to a witness who identified the subject as the shooter and said he left the, car, left the scene in a brown sedan. Uh, authorities put out a bolo for the individual and the vehicle shortly after the incident report. Uh, other Metro Dade officers located the vehicle traveling northbound on South Dixie Highway. They conducted a traffic stop. They detained the driver. Before they placed him in handcuffs, they spotted a semi-automatic handgun on his lap. Authorities said the gun was left inside of his vehicle for police to investigate. Investigators learned that following an argument between the victim and a witness, the dispute became physical. Both parties were separated. Following the argument, Hills, the, the defendant, left the residence, went to his vehicle. He began to reverse. The victim grabbed a glass bottle from the home, threw it at the vehicle, did not strike it. Shortly after the victim threw the bottle, the defendant pulled out a handgun, shot the victim, fled the area. Police located him uh, about an hour later. They took him into custody. They gave him water and allowed him to smoke a cigarette while being interviewed. He asked, quote, is this about a homicide? They then brought him into an interview room. He invoked. He stated he wanted an attorney present. That's what we had. We didn't have anything else. Let me now read the arrest report. On Thursday, September 28th at approximately 4.30 p.m., uniform officers of Miami-Dade Police Department responded to the location reference a person shot. Upon officer's arrival, a witness on scene provided information that was used to issue a bolo advising the shooter by name uh, and that he had left the scene in a specific brown sedan with a specific Florida license plate. So the bolo went out for the car with the license plate with the name. Village of Palmetto Bay officers located the vehicle traveling northbound on South Dixie Highway. They stopped the vehicle. They detained the male driver. The male was identified by name, same individual that the name was given to by the witnesses. While being detained, officers advised that there was a holstered firearm on the defendant's lap. The firearm was described as a semi-automatic handgun with a gray colored slide and a black colored frame. The firearm was left inside of the defendant's vehicle. At approximately uh, an hour later, this investigator was contacted via police radio to respond and assume responsibility. This investigator learned that a verbal dispute had occurred between the victim and a witness. The dispute became physical. The parties were separated. The defendant left the residence. He entered his vehicle. He began to back out. The victim grabbed a glass bottle from the residence and exited. Standing behind the defendant's vehicle, the victim threw the bottle in the direction of the defendant's vehicle, which did not strike it. The defendant exited the vehicle, produced a gray handgun, and shot the victim. Defendant then drove out of the driveway and fled. Defendant was transported to the station. He was afforded an opportunity to eat and drink. The defendant refused food. He requested this investigator provide him with a moment to smoke a cigarette and a glass of water. This investigator allowed the defendant to smoke a cigarette as well as to drink water. While doing so, the defendant asked this investigator, quote, is this about a homicide? This investigator told the defendant to finish his cigarette and we would speak as soon as uh, he was done. After we concluded, this investigator brought the defendant into an interview room where he was presented with a pre-printed Miranda wave warning form. The defendant began to read the form stated to this investigator that he wanted an attorney present. This investigator concluded the interview. Defendant was arrested, charged, and transported. Defendant's vehicle was impounded. Defendant's firearm was impounded. Officers on scene using body-worn camera are blah, blah, blah. So, as you can tell, the 
arrest report is a lot more detailed than obviously the news media report that we were operating on last week. We now know that the guy did exit his, well, at least according to the police, he did exit his vehicle and intentionally drew and shot at somebody who had threw a, a bottle at his car. Well, he, he was, was in Right. He's in the car driving away. The guy throws the bottle, misses. He stops the car, gets out of the car, pulls out a gun, turns around and shoots the guy, gets back in his car and drives off the scene. Does not look good. No. I want to I also want to mention something. So when I first started reading the report, right, I'm reading this as a former prosecutor, even even as a criminal defense lawyer. And I'm saying a witness gave them information. And my first knee jerk reaction is. They better give the name of the witness. Like as a prosecutor, what am I going to do with this? As a defense attorney, you're thinking, you better give me that witness. But, 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 hold on. You keep reading for all of you to understand. Anonymous witnesses are okay as long as the police can independently corroborate. So when this witness said so-and-so driving a, a certain colored vehicle with a tag number and he shot somebody, when the cops pull up, they stopped the car with the tag. It was the same color. It was the guy's name, and he had a gun. So they don't need to list that witness because they independently corroborated everything that the witness said. If the witness wants to stay anonymous, at this point, they can. Now, your defense attorney can hire a private investigator to try and find out who that witness is, but the cops and the state attorney don't have a duty to turn that person over because the police were able to independently corroborate everything that the witness told them. So just so you understand how some of these things work. And let me add to that also, as, as we have said many times, the arrest report is merely a blanket statement of probable cause. It is not a dispositive statement of everything and every piece of evidence in the case. So if they don't list that witness by name in that report, it doesn't mean that they don't have that person's name and then they're not gonna turn it over to the state attorney's office. So, so maybe still at this point, turn it over, but they don't really have to at this point. They but whether to. they do or don't, the point is that the police report only needs to meet the criterion of stating sufficient facts and circumstances to justify the reasonably prudent police officer who's confronted with those very same facts and circumstances to believe that a crime was committed in their jurisdiction by a specific individual. That's it. More probable than not that the crime occurred. Right. It's not. They're not trying a case in that report. And it's it's interesting because I taught a class uh, about two months ago at, at a local police department. They asked me to come in and speak about arrest reports. And they had a prosecutor come in and speak before me. And the feedback that I got from them was very interesting because what I told them as a defense attorney was, the less you put in that report, the better. Only say what you have to say. What you ought to be doing with any police report is... You ought, with any probable cause report, an affidavit, is you ought to be hitting every point in every element of every offense that you charge, but just enough to cover it so that you can show that you've hit that element. You don't need to give them chapter and verse. The more you put in that report, that sworn statement, the more Ed and I have to play with later. The less you put in that report, the less we have to play with later. Interestingly, the prosecutor who spoke before me told him the exact opposite. He said, put everything in there, the most detail that you possibly can. I don't want to know who it was. I, I don't know who it was. I never asked. I can tell you that as a former prosecutor, Michael's 100% correct. And that's the way I trained my cops. The arrest affidavit. Look, it's very simple. The arrest form or the arrest affidavit is literally supposed to be a summary of their Offense incident report, which is a much more detailed report. This what Michael read to you is the arrest affidavit, the arrest form. Later on, they will do an offense incident report where they would put a lot more detail. And there's going to be supplemental reports by other officers that put details as to what they did. The reason you don't want to put a lot in the A form is couple. Number one, first and foremost, it's public record. It's public record. You don't need people knowing out there, even as a cop or as a prosecutor, you don't need that. These officers did a good job because what did they establish? Everything they needed to get to, is it more probable than not that it occurred? To put everything in there would be what we need as a prosecutor to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. So maybe the prosecutor that said that doesn't understand what these forms are for 
And they were thinking along the terms of reasonable doubt. Well, I, I, I have a different explanation. My explanation is they're lazy. Okay. <laughs> the more that you put in the report, the less they have to investigate during their pre-file conference. So if the report is bare bone, they can call in the officer and say, is everything in here accurate? Yeah. Okay. Next. Well, good, good. Otherwise, they actually have to ask questions. Or, actually- or, or read the offense incident report before they do the pre-file. Now, you still need the pre-file. Again, for citizens, for you guys to understand this. The way it works is a state attorney will call in the lead detective or somebody who can give them the information they need, and we actually swear them in. We swear them in. Raise your right hand. Raise your, raise your about to tell me the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes. Okay, put it down. Let me ask you, what happened this? And what about this? Hey, what's the witness's name? Do you have the witness's name? Yeah, what's the witness's name? da 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 why didn't you put it in the A-phone? Do they want to stay anonymous? No, 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 no. I just thought that, you know, no big deal. I didn't want to put it in the A-phone. Cool. Okay. Or, yeah, they really want to stay anonymous. So Well, the, either way, the prosecutor ultimately has to tender that information to the defense. And, you know, this is well, not. Like I let's said, not, let's but, not get. It's and, like I said. It's because they're being lazy. Because they're going to have to ask these questions. Exactly. But let's, let's not, not get. Not. Maybe let's not get bogged it. down in the minutia. Let's get on to our next case. Because we're already ahead. over time. All right, I'm going to read you another A form because this is a short one. This is an arrest that happened on September 19th of this year in the city of Fort Lauderdale. The individual is a female, uh, 29 years old. On September 19th, 2023, the defendant contacted Broward County Regional Communication Center. That's she dialed 911. She stated the following, and these are quotes, and the reason they're quotes is every 911 call is recorded, so it's very easy to figure out what somebody said word for word. Quote, there's going to be three bombs. They're going to be a bomb at the Broward County Courthouse. That is going to be in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. There is going to be a bomb on Exit 21, Hollywood Boulevard, the police station right across from Target. The last bomb will be at the Joe DiMaggio Memorial Hospital. The defendant was taken into custody at her residence, located at whatever. While speaking with the defendant, I informed her that I was investigating a bomb threat at the courthouse Hollywood Police Department. She then spontaneously uttered Joe DiMaggio Hospital. It was later learned that the defendant had posted threats on her Instagram account I, I don't know. Can't read whatever that word is. I, I it's don't know. Her, whatever. It's her account handle or whatever. Oh, okay. Got it. The defendant stated the following quote, there's too many hospitals and police stations to shoot up. So Hollywood PD and the Broward Sheriff's office will be shot up first. I'll find their families and wipe them off the face of the earth. Not the children though. The defendant is being charged with three counts of false reports concerning place of an explosive device and written threats to kill. So the charges are, she has four second degree felonies, which means each punishable by 15 years, she's looking at a maximum of 60 years in prison. Remember, again, what we just said, the police report needs to hit the elements of the offense. So what do they do here? They charged her with making false bomb report threats. There were no bombs found at any of these locations. So she threatened three different institutions. Specifically, they've got her voice on 911. They have the origin call number and address because 911 uh, uh, tracks incoming calls so that they can dispatch officers immediately. They actually went to that residence. They located her. They identified her. And as the officer wrote this up, they, they only mentioned two of the three. She corrected them and threw in the third, Joe DiMaggio, just to make sure they didn't miss anything. That, that, that right there was the fourth bomb, her stupidity. Yeah. And then when they, I guess they dug through her social media, uh, which is very routine these days for cops and prosecutors to do, and they found other threats. And of course, when you, when you do something like that on, on, on a public uh, domain, that, that's a criminal act too. So um, look, the police did their job first and foremost to make sure that this was not a real, uh, 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 pardon the pun, but explosive situation, right? They didn't have to evacuate this children's hospital, the courthouse or the police station. 
that's first and foremost. So they make sure that the threat is not real or verify that it is real, in which case they can, you know, attempt to, to, to deal with those situations. So I think the cops hit every point, And this is a great example of an A form that is short, sweet and to the point. There's no mistaking the elements of the offenses here. And there's no superfluous information. Thoughts? I think both of them were written that way. I think both were very good. I think they were written that way. Um, the way you should. Just enough to get you past probable cause. Uh, I think this woman's going to probably regret what she did. I don't even understand why you would do something like that. But then again, it's not our place to understand why people do things. Well, I, I disagree with you to a, to, on, a, on, a, on a side level. When I read this A form, the first thing that, that comes to my mind is mental health. Oh, yeah. Well, so, but, so but Michael, I do. Michael, hold on. Hold on. Because I was thinking that, too. And I was going to mention this is a case where you might want to look into mental health. But I'll be honest with you, Michael. There may not be mental health. Not, not to the level. If, of, I, if I were a betting man, I would go all in that this is a mental health defense and a mental health case. And if this woman contacted me, my discussion with her would go along these lines. I need to bring in a forensic expert to conduct a mental status examination and give you a battery of tests. If you're not cool with that, I'm not the right lawyer for your case, because that's the first thing I need to know. I need to know whether or not I can levy a mental health defense here, because I believe that this is either a truly evil, sick, despicable person who should be thrown in a hole for the rest of her life, or she's mentally ill. And I'm putting my money on mentally ill. Now, I don't know her. She could have a, a laundry list of priors. I have no idea. She could be a psych patient. She could be off her meds. She could, uh, you know, anything is possible here, but that's what it screams to me as a defense lawyer. And, and here's the thing. I think it's, it definitely has mental health issues. The reason I said hold off on that, I mean, first of all, let me be crystal clear. I agree with you on that. No matter what, I would ask for a mental health evaluation on this person because there's clearly some mental health issues. But that being said, well, when you say I would ask for a mental health, who, who are you asking? I would I would either hire somebody myself or have the court do it. But OK, so see, and here we differ. I wouldn't bring this to the court's attention. Well, I would. I mean, you keep interrupting me. Slow down, brother. I'm just trying to be just trying to be detailed. OK, because in an investigation, details matter. All right, Reacher. <laughs> no, what I'm saying is. At some point, somehow, she would have to be evaluated, right? So I would get my own investigator, my own, I mean, doctor. I would bring in my own doctor to evaluate her first for this reason. But eventually, if she does qualify for mental health diversion, I would want the court to put their own. But why do I bring in my own? For the reason that I was trying to say at the very beginning. She may not have a qualifying mental disorder. She may have a mental disorder. But it still has to be one that qualifies. So I'm telling you, Michael. Well, I qualifies for, for, you're talking about qualification for mental health diversion, Gord. Correct. Okay, I'm not necessarily going there. You're, you're jumping ahead for me. Because for me, I'm not thinking about diversion court yet. First, I'm thinking that it is a mental health issue, and let me lock that down. If I lock that down, then I have to figure out whether or not it's even possible, because there's a lot of charges that are not eligible for diversion court. That's also but, true. But mental health is always available if it's legit for a statutory mitigator. And so I start working a case like this with two things at once. Number one, the legal end, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. I want to hear the 911 call. I want to verify that what these guys put in quotes actually was said. I want to see the CAD reports. I want to know that they were dispatched in real time to the location and match it up to the call. You know, in other words, make sure that it is what it purports to be and not just accept it at face value because we might find a screw up somewhere. But let's assume that that does all go. My second tier, which I'm working at the same time, is mitigation. And this is one of those cases where right up front, I'm thinking mitigation immediately. Because, well, because I got to figure if they've got her on tape and if they went to her house and if she made those statements and if they're wearing body cam and if all of this is unavoidably true, then all we can do is hope to be able to get some compassion from the court for somebody who was either incapable of forming the requisite mental intent and using it as a legitimate defense or using it as a mitigator to suggest that 
it's only because she suffers from this condition that this happened. And if we get her in treatment and we get her medicated and she's responsibly uh, abiding by the protocols as, as established by mental health professionals, then we can re rest relatively assured that we won't have a repeat. And the, and the good news is that there was no mom. Right. Because that makes it a lot easier to get everybody on board if she does suffer from a mental health issue to get her mental health help. Right. It's an awful lot easier for, for prosecutors and judges to have compassion for people who make threats than it is for people who actually go through with the threats, you know? Right. Um, so, so, and, and then again, it may be an insanity defense for all I know. I mean, that's as, as rare as those are, they do exist. And so again, that's one of the things that I would want my forensic expert to, to either rule in or rule out for me and say, right. Mike, you know, remember, look, Ed and I are lawyers. We're not psychologists. Although sometimes I do, like in my personal dating life, tell people that I'm a prison psychologist instead of saying I'm a criminal defense lawyer. Because to some degree, it's true. We are jail psychologists. We have to use a lot of psychology when we deal with our clients in jail. I mean, that's just the reality. Uh, you know, between their own insanity and the, the nonsense is being nonstop shoveled in their ears and up their noses and down their throats by the, every idiot in the jail. I'm and getting, they're so desperate. I'm getting PTSD as we speak. I know it's, 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 that's the toughest part of the job. All right. So I think every, we're every, every time that a client, I get a response from a client sitting in jail. I want you to send me all the discovery so I can review it. I'm thinking, here we go. Here we go. He's going to tell me how he's going to try this case. Let's let's get on to the next one, because I think this one you're going to particularly love, Ed. Um, this is a this one is is an arrest pursuant to a warrant. So it's not the traditional probable cause affidavit. Usually most arrests on a state level are done in the moment. Right. They're in response to a call like the first case that we had. There was a shooting. Somebody called 911. And the arrest came from there. So the arrest report was written on the spot. The last one that we just talked about, uh, 911 got this call, threats of bombs. They, they dispatched the officers and they made the arrest and wrote up the PC. This case is a little different. This case involves a Broward County Sheriff's deputy who was ratted out to the Internal Affairs or Public Corruptions Division of the Broward County Sheriff's Department and accused of, of, of doing some illegal things. And so BSO investigators started investigating their own deputy. So in this case, they actually conducted a full-blown investigation behind her back without her knowledge. And then once they had secured all of the evidence, rather than showing up at her door and making a probable cause arrest, they reduced it to a written affidavit in support of a request for a search war uh, an arrest warrant and went to a circuit court judge and said, judge, we'd like an arrest warrant for this individual. So this is a de facto, it is still a statement of probable cause, but it is a different format because it's done in, in the form of an affidavit in support of a search warrant. And when so, you do these, just so we're crystal clear, but when you do these <clears throat> state attorneys, if they're involved, because sometimes they don't really have to be involved, but, I think almost every every county has state attorneys get involved, like we do in Dade County. While it still says probable cause on the arrest warrant, the better practice in this case is for state attorneys to put in the, as much information as they think is necessary to show a, a judge mm -hmm. that they'll be able to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen that way, because the defense attorney still is going to come in and pick things apart and do whatever their job is. But that's the difference. When a state attorney is involved, they really should be a little more detailed because now you are looking at it as a lawyer and as a state attorney who's going to try the case. And you should put in information when you hand that to the judge that the judge says, oh, yeah, yeah, this looks like they did it. Not necessarily mean they did, mm -hmm. but it looks a lot stronger. Go ahead, Mike. All right. So I'm not going to read every word of this because it is it is like Ed said, it is far more detailed than the than the traditional complaint arrest affidavit. But um, so so forgive me as I skip. The first section is entitled affidavit and application for an arrest warrant. It identifies the, the officer seeking the warrant and it explains uh, 
what the warrant is seeking. And it itemizes two counts. They're both for the same thing. Uh, uttering a forged instrument. Uttering a forged instrument is like passing a bad check or, or, or uh, 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 creating a false document. So in this case, uh, they claim that under count one, uh, this individual who, by the way, is enhanced because she is, quote, a public servant. Um, it says that she intentionally and knowingly altered a fraudulent pay stub, knowing it to be false with the intent to defraud uh, a leasing company looking to get an apartment. And count two uh, is the same thing for a different uh, uh, company. Then it goes to affiant qualifications. And the officer puts in there that, that this particular deputy has been with BSO for 11 years, assigned to the public corruption unit, has probable cause to believe that physical, physical evidence exists, uh, grounds for issuance. Following grounds constitute affiant's reason for belief that the laws of the state of Florida were violated and the facts establishing the grounds for this affidavit and probable cause for believing so are follows. And then it literally says probable cause. And here's the statement of probable cause. On July 26, 2023, by the way, this arrest occurred, this warrant was issued uh, August 30th. Michael, can so, I interrupt you for one second? Yeah, go ahead. As you're reading this, I think it'd be interesting for the, for the audience to know what we call are the elements of uttering a forged instrument. Okay. Go ahead. So that you can read, as Michael reads along, ask yourself, there's only three things that are necessary for somebody to be charged with this or be uh, convicted for, of this. Okay, so let me get through the check quickly. I already had it up, but I don't know where it went, so let me open it again. Number one, the defendant, a person, or in this case, the defendant, passed or uh, offered to pass as true a document. Number two, the defendant knew that the document was false. And number three, that the defendant intended to injure or defraud someone or a firm. That's it. Did they pass it off as being true? Did they know it was false? And did they try to defraud a person or a firm? So, Michael, as you read that, let's see if we've got those three elements, right? Okay. There. So we're going back. Now, remember, the, the, the date of the arrest is August 30th, and and they claim the date of this incident or this starting point here is July 26th. So it's about a month and a little less than a week earlier. Uh, BSO public corruption unit was forwarded information by an online anonymous tip submitted through sheriff.org. And then it itemizes the date, time and the uh, employee complaint form reference allegations of fraud by a BSO employee. The tip alleged that the employee creates and sells fake pay subs, having falsified false pay subs of her own and submitting them to a particular address, a residential apartment leasing company in Broward County. Right. So we've got the firm. After I received the initial information, I was able to verify that this individual does reside at that particular address due to a previous incident where she was involved in a domestic disturbance with her boyfriend at that address. On July 27th, I drafted a subpoena for the property management company and requested all records retain, pertaining to this individual. The next day, the company manager provided the lease application, which had been completed and submitted on July 18th of 2021. The lease agreement was from 9721 to 9623. With the application, she listed her employment information as, I'm not going to say the name of the company, but some other company, not BSO, with whom she was employed, with a monthly income of $5,500. So let's call that company A, so we can keep track of that, okay? She provided two pay stubs from company A. In addition, she provided a 2020 W-2 earnings summary reporting her yearly salary is $59,524.92 from company A. So we've got the defendant passing off documents as being true. Now the question is, were they true and did she know they were false? Or are they actually false and did she know? Because we've already got the first two elements. She passed off these documents as being legit and it's her. Keep going. The individual listed her email as X. However, 
on the electronic document signature, he, it shows that she signed the document using a different email on a Safari, using the Safari browser on an iPhone with the IP address, and they list that out. It should be noted that she is a sworn Broward Sheriff's deputy, and she is currently assigned to whatever. I obtained her employment application to Broward Sheriff. It was completed and submitted on X date. Upon reviewing the application, I observed that she did not list company A on her employment history. On I mean, August to. On August 7th, 2023, I drafted a subpoena for the, uh, let's call it now company B. This is the place where she allegedly worked. Um, it was received, it was reviewed and approved by a specific assistant state attorney. At approximately 2.30 p.m., I met with Blank, who is the owner of, the, of Company B. She provided a, rec a recorded sworn statement. In summary, she stated that the school has been open since October 2015. She has no records of a present or former employee named X. I showed her a copy of the pay stub and W-2 form, which had been provided to Company A. She stated it did not appear to be the same that her school issues, her school uses ADP payroll company, and the W-2 form was not issued by her company, Company B. On August 8th, I authored search warrants for the deputies listed emails, which were both reviewed by the ASA and by a judge. On August 14th, I received and reviewed records from Yahoo and Gmail. Upon further looking into the Gmail account, I see that she applied to a company C for an apartment. On the emails to the company manager, she provided a leasing agent with pay stubs from company B showing a monthly income of approximately $7,000. It should be noted that she also provided the company with her BSO pay stubs, but she listed company B as her second, quote, secondary job, indicating that she earns a monthly income of approximately $11,000. Okay, so let's, let's pause right there because I know there's a lot more, but right there. We have already enough for an arrest, right? Who she is. She provided these documents to company A saying that she worked at company B. And these were documents that she reserved, re received as a result of working for company B. We go to company B and we find out that's not true, right? Uh, that she never worked there and she never did. So she apparently looks like she was doing this to be able to get a lease where she was living because she had to prove more income. Um, the only thing left is to prove the intent that she knew that these documents were fraudulent, which that's part of what we go to trial for. But I think there's enough. But there's more, isn't there, Michael? Yeah. Uh, the application was denied. So she extended her residential lease with company A for an additional year, and that is where she currently resides. BSO Human Resources show that in May of 2022, her income was approximately $4,500 a month. She did intentionally inflate her monthly salary income using Company B's fraudulent pay stubs with the intent to secure an apartment lease with Company C. While reviewing the records, I also located pay stubs made to an employee listed as blank, who is her boyfriend. Those pay stubs appeared to be in from a business named whatever, during a record search, I was unable to verify that that business existed through the Florida Department of Corporations. Also, the phone number listed on the pay stub, blank, is listed to a different company, while the phone number listed for the employee is registered to the defendant. This, in this investigation revealed the defendant did intentionally forge fraudulent pay stubs, knowing to be false, with the intent to obtain and secure or attempt to secure a residential leasing apartment. And that is the, the affidavit in support of the warrant, which was ultimately issued, and she was ultimately arrested. So what you see here is really good police work. I mean, this is an example of very good police work, and a defense attorney is going to have a very hard time with this case. And he's in conjunction with the state attorney, which is what I did in narcotics and what I did in economic crimes. That's why you see it's a little different. It's what I always try to tell the audience. It's a little different when somebody says, I was a former prosecutor. Well, if you were in the pits... It's a little different to what you do as a special unit prosecutor because you you have to analyze these cases in a way that you have to already anticipate what the defense attorneys are going to do 
before you draft the affidavit. See, when Michael gets this affidavit, if I was a state attorney, my goal is for him to get it and say, we're effed. We're effed. So you have to make sure that you meet all the elements. And this is what I would do. I would pull up the jury instructions for Florida. I'd look at all my elements. And I'd tell the officer, let's go one by one. You know what? We're missing an element here. Let's do a little more investigation. Let's go over here. Let's go over there. Let's do this so we can get all the elements. And it's a much more detailed police work and you're working hand in hand with them to make sure it gets done right. So, yeah, I mean, and that's that's a great point. And that's why one of the reasons that this particular individual is going to have a very hard time soon to be ex deputy. I'm, I'm I mean, look, the usual one. Right. What's the hardest thing for a state attorney to prove in any case? Intent. Intent. Intent is always the hardest thing because typically you have to get into the defendant's head and show a jury what was in the defendant's head. But there are ways to prove it circumstantially, right? And, like and here it's here it's as plain as day, even though it's circumstantial, right? Because there's no question that if she created and submitted these bogus pay stubs, the purpose that she was doing was to get out of the apartment she was in and probably into a nicer apartment. And and, and notice what the state attorney did or the officer. I don't know who was the one that put decided to put this in the warrant or investigate. But that's why they did two businesses, and that's why they also put in there that she did the same thing for her boyfriend, because that's the circumstantial evidence of intent. You see what I'm saying? It wasn't just for her. It wasn't a mistake. She did it for her boyfriend, too. This is not a mistake. So Well, and also, remember, they're going to, the other thing is, you can rest assured that while this investigation was going on, this deputy was still working. She had no clue that this was happening. That's number one. Number two, um, you know that when they effectuated the arrest, I don't know for sure, because again, I don't, I'm not, you know, intimately uh, uh, connected with the file, but I would assume uh, based on the, the, the quality of, of, of investigative work that was laid out in the, uh, in the warrant affidavit, I would assume that they showed up with a search warrant and they also collected her computer and any paperwork that they could find and they're going to go through that with a fine tooth comb and probably come up with whatever software she used to create these documents if she was dumb enough to do it on her own equipment. Right? Text so they're, they're not done here. Text messages, like maybe one from the boyfriend. Hey, baby, can you, did you, did you, did you draft those documents for me yet so I can submit it for the job? Who knows? But they'll be looking, they'll be looking for everything. They will get a warrant for that. They will search for all that. And of course, if they find that corroborating physical evidence, that's like the proverbial stake through the heart. Ready? When they mentioned in there that she used a, a different cell phone and she used Safari, they have those records already. They already subpoenaed yeah. them. They know exactly what she's been doing. It's, it's solid police work. Very good Solid police work. And, and probably for the reason that you said, I mean, not to take anything away from the detective, but they were they were smart enough to work in conjunction with an assistant state attorney who is a lawyer, you know, and so they're 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 really a, a well oiled machine in this case, as opposed to the other ones we read where the state attorney just gets this. Sometimes it's a dumpster fire dropped on their desk. Sometimes it's all tied up with a with a nice, neat bow and a ribbon, too. But right. the point is, you get what you get. Whereas, if you're working with the state attorney, the overwhelming odds are you're going to have an airtight case like that one. Unless, of course, it's a state attorney who's telling officers to put everything in the in the arrest form. All right, let's get through our last police report. I apologize; it's a little bit of a I'm long sorry. one, but I, I, I promise big. you, it's extremely uh, 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 upsetting. So let me warn you in advance. On October fifth, twenty three, at approximately. 748 uh, approximately 748 p.m. Broward County Regional Communications received a 911 call from a female who identified herself as blank. This subject called from phone number blank. She advised that she was 12 years old and that a man had taken her in a vehicle and sexually assaulted her. The caller further stated that the vehicle that she was in was involved in a crash and she was able to escape. She described herself as a white female wearing a school uniform, which consisted of a black shirt and a beige skirt. The caller further advised the vehicle she was taken in was a black or gray vehicle. She described the subject that took her as a bald white male and that he took her from a CVS somewhere near the Hard Rock. She provided the address of 2800 Hollywood Boulevard as her current location. 
Broward County Regional Communications, again, 911, also received a call advising of an accident at 28th Avenue and Hollywood Boulevard at approximately the same time. Officers arrived on the scene shortly after the call was dispatched and were immediately greeted by a bald white male who offered his driver's license. Sergeant Blank noted that the subject's hand was shaking. He appeared nervous. As the sergeant was in contact with the male subject, he became aware of the suspect description via police radio, and he realized the male he was speaking to matched the description provided by the victim to dispatch. The sergeant detained the subject for further investigation. He was later identified by a North Carolina driver's license. Contact was made with the female caller at a Shell gas station located at 2800 Hollywood Boulevard. She was identified as a 12-year-old female who will from here in be referred to as victim. Responding officer conducted a show-up with the victim who positively ID'd the subject. A show-up means that they took this girl into a police car and they drove her by the scene where they had this guy in custody. And she said, yeah, that's the guy. He didn't see her. They didn't come into contact. It was, right. That's why they called it a, a show-up, drive-by. Victim was transported to the Hollywood Police Department where detectives conducted an interview. During the interview, victim stated that she had left her home earlier in the day. She was walking in an unknown direction, making turns as she walked. She advised that she eventually made it to the CVS store that appeared run down. From this CVS, she could see the guitar-shaped Hard Rock Hotel, but she was unable to say what direction the hotel was in relation to the CVS. While at the CVS, she was approached by a white male with a bald head. She described him as being approximately 48 or 49 years old. She advised that he grabbed her by the arm and forced her into the front passenger seat of his vehicle. She described the vehicle as being a small four-door car, gray in color. She described the interior as being, quote, fancy, high tech. She further described the car as having Apple Play. The keys had a blue keychain on them. She said it had a blue keychain with a logo. She believes that it occurred at approximately three o'clock in the afternoon, but she's unsure of the exact time. Once inside of the car, the man began driving in an unknown direction. He told the victim he was going to take her to a police station. While driving, she asked, he asked her several questions, including what type of music she liked and if she was wearing a wire. After asking if she was wearing a wire, he started to touch and frisk her. She described this action as him putting his hand up the front and back of her shirt and then rubbing his hand on her chest and back underneath her shirt, but over her bra. She said that she told the male that she did not consent. She told him that this was a sexual assault. She said the male scoffed at her. They continued driving in circles and in alleyways in unknown locations. She described the male as making several attempts to hold her hand and touch her leg while driving. She also advised the male took all of the items out of a small backpack that she had, placing them into the center area of the front seat of his vehicle. After emptying the contents of the bag, he put them back into the bag and placed the bag on the floor. Victim described the items in the bag as being a perfume bottle, a beaded bracelet, and other items. She believes that one of her bracelets, a print bracelet with stars, may have been inadvertently left in the cup holder area of the vehicle. The male continued driving the vehicle. Victim stated that he was on his cell phone a lot. He appeared to be tilting the phone away from her to hide what he was doing. The male continued driving and later put his hand inside of the victim's shorts and underwear and tried to, quote, finger her. Victim described him as stroking the outside of her vagina. However, he did not penetrate with his fingers. The male also put his hands under victim's shirt, touching her breasts and trying to, quote, twist her nipple. As the male was doing this, the car they were driving in was involved in a car crash. This provided the victim with the opportunity to exit the vehicle, at which time she ran into the Shell gas station and asked the clerk to dial 911. During her interview, she advised that once she was inside of the male's car, she knew he was going to harm her and that he was, quote, a stupid douchebag pedophile. She waited for an opportunity to escape. She was provided that opportunity at the moment of the car crash. It should be noted that the victim's description of the vehicle was consistent with that of the vehicle being driven, which is a four-door 2023 Hyundai Venue, gray in color, bearing whatever tag. He also had the keys to the vehicle in his possession when he was taken into custody. On the key ring was a Crunch Gym membership keychain, blue and white in color, consistent to the keychain described by victim. In an effort to determine the exact location of the CVS where the male forced the victim into the vehicle, 
detectives transported her to her home and then retraced her steps with her. They ultimately arrived at the CVS uh, located in the city of Hollywood. Victim pointed out the location on the sidewalk where she was standing when approached. This location was the sidewalk on the west side of the roadway directly in front of CVS. Due to the fact that the business was closed, detectives were unable to access surveillance at that time. While in the car with detectives, victim advised the male initially told her he was going to take her to the police station and he was searching for the address for the FBI on his phone. He then drove her to a location with a large building, gray in color, with a lot of windows. Victim advised that there was a sign identify the building as, an S as the FBI building. Victim's description of this building is consistent with the FBI building located in Miramar. Victim believed the male was attempting to gain her trust by saying that he was taking her to the FBI and then actually driving her to the location. However, they did not stop there. Upon arriving at the building, the male did not stop. He continued driving. After leaving the FBI building, she does not know where he drove, but they went through a lot of neighborhoods. It should be noted the vehicle hit on a license plate reader in Pembroke Road heading northbound. The vehicle hit on a license plate reader at Hiatus Road, subsequently heading northbound, consistent with leaving the FBI building and heading eastbound towards the city of Hollywood. Uh, FBI building was, excuse me, city of Hollywood. Victim was later transported to sexual assault treatment center where an exalt exa assault examination was conducted. I attempted to get a statement from the defendant. However, after being read Miranda, he requested an attorney be present before speaking to me. As he was stating that he wanted an attorney, he made several utterances. He stated that he heard what the accusations against him were, but he denied them. He stated, quote, all I was trying to do was help her. He admitted to, quote, taking her to the federal building, FBI building off Pembroke, but they were closed. So I was taking her down here and she made accusations and stuff, saying that she ran away five times and the police keep putting her back with her parents. He then again stated he wanted a lawyer. It should be noted that he made these statements on his own accord after requesting an attorney. They were not in response to any questions asked by this officer. The interaction was recorded using audio and video. The suspect issued North Carolina driver's license, advised he was not sure of his current address because he had just moved to Florida for employment. However, he is a North Carolina resident. It is unknown if the subject will flee to North Carolina due to, his invest due to this investigation. End of report. All right. First, as always, everybody's innocent until they can be proven guilty. This is horrific. She was a 12-year-old girl. I have one glaring question, I, and maybe I missed it. They don't make it clear, Michael, on how or why he initially grabbed her and threw her in the car. Like, she doesn't say what his thought process were. Like, why would he think, what, that she was running away? That I don't, I, that part is very unclear. Well, I have a bigger, I have a bigger things. If it weren't true, I don't know. I have a bigger global issue. Okay. This violates the rule of brevity. They put way too much in this report. I, and I will tell you as a defense attorney, my first thought is, I don't know that this girl is telling the truth. Right. Her statement is so convoluted and long and detailed and for right. a 12 year old kid. I've got some some questions as to whether or not any of this is actually true or how much of it is true. Let's just right. say right. on the flip. Go ahead. Me too. I agree with you. Listen, you've read thousands of a forms. I've read probably twice as many as you be, only because I was a state attorney and I got thousands of them when I was working there. This this a form reads odd. It, it, there's there's some things that just are left unsaid that make no sense. And you're right. Part of it is, since there's so much in there, you're thinking, well, why aren't you going to explain that? Like, that's the first thing and you need to explain. What what happened? Like, did he get out of the car, just grab her by the arm and throw her in? And or Well, you know, here's another thing. Allegedly, this starts at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and it ends at almost 8 o'clock at night. What are they doing for five hours? What are they doing for five hours? How is this guy sexually assaulting her in a car for five hours driving around? It, it really, it stinks. The, the, the story stinks. Now, it doesn't mean it's not true. No, and we have I, to. You know, the state attorney has to investigate. Everybody has to investigate. And none of us, neither Michael nor I, are denying that or, or saying that the victim is a liar. What we're saying no. is that some of this is just very odd 
and it needs to be investigated. And there may be more to it than this, too. Again, you know, who knows? She may have voluntarily, happily gotten into this guy's car. She may have flagged him down for all we know. Uh, maybe she is a runaway who's who's tried to get away from her house several times and the cops keep bringing her home to mom and dad and she's desperate to get away from them. Maybe she begged this guy to touch her. Maybe the guy never laid a finger on her and she's upset that he didn't. You know, here's one of the problems that I have with this. As a defense lawyer, this is not a case I would I would accept. I don't care how much money the guy is willing to offer me. And even if even if, you know, uh, a, a busload of bishops and a cardinal to boot showed up at my door and said this guy is innocent and he had a little halo around his head. I don't want to have to cross examine and destroy this 12 year old girl on the witness stand. But so I'm smelling question. I'm smelling bullshit all over this story. I'll, it does not reek as true. It's the one case I won't take, sexual battery on minors. I mean, if she's 16, maybe 17, depends. But at this age, I don't care, Michael, because I took one once when I first left the state attorney's office. Um, or my client, you know, I sat with him and I told him, listen, I am not going to depose this little girl. I'll do everything I can, but I'm not deposing her and we're not going to trial. No, 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 fine. I thought that would insulate me from feeling like I had to take a bath. It didn't, Michael. It didn't. It didn't help. Yeah, listen, the, this is a case. The, the, how do I say this? We're all sentient individuals, right? Each of us. And we all have our, our, our comfort zones and our discomfort zones. And for a criminal defense lawyer, there's a lot of different crimes. I mean, you've got everything from misdemeanors to murder. You've got everything from jaywalking to... Uh, carjacking. Uh, you know, you've got everything from burglary to battery. There, there's so many different charges across the spectrum. You've got state court, you've got federal court, you've got appellate court. There, there, there's so much to choose from. And there are plenty of lawyers that will take anything that comes in the door. And, and we're, not judging, of, we're not judging them. And, right. No, no, it's just, it's just your, your business plan. And then there are plenty of lawyers that find the niche area of the law. And, and so they focus on one particular thing. A great example of that is DUI. There are a lot of really excellent DUI lawyers that if I got a DUI, I would be going to talk to, but I would never hire them on any other type of case because that's what they do. You know, it's like, a, it's like if you go to an orthopedic surgeon that specializes on one particular vertebrae and that's all he does, you know, you're not going to go see him for something outside of his comfort zone. Or if you do, you're pulling him out of that. So... There are criminal defense lawyers that have absolutely no qualm with these types of charges. In fact, they wind up specializing in these types of cases and everybody refers them to them because so many people are turned off either for the reason that I have, which is I don't want to see an innocent guy go to jail. But if I had to choose between an innocent guy going to jail or me having to cross examine and destroy a 12 year old lying kid on the witness stand. That's a really tough call for me that's and exactly, one I don't want to have to make. That's exactly how I feel. It's a no for me, it's a no-win situation because if he's guilty, I'm disgusted. And if he's innocent, then I gotta attack a 12-year-old. I, I, it's a no-win. Yeah, this is this is one of those cases where you know the charges themselves are so ugly. Let me tell you what he was charged with. He was charged with two counts of kidnapping and sexual bat kidnapping with a sexual battery. No, excuse me. He was charged with one count of kidnapping with a sexual battery, okay. which is an enhancer to the kidnapping. He was charged with one count of false imprisonment with a sexual battery. He was charged with sexually assaulting a 12 year old. He was charged with lewd and lascivious molestation two counts. He was charged with misdemeanor battery. And then he got a, uh, a gratuitous traffic citation for running a red light. Well, I don't know if it's gratuitous. He probably ran the red light. <laughs> Disobeying a red light. Yeah. It's, it's the least of his worries. Well, right? they didn't mention that in the A form anywhere. Now, did they? Well, or they maybe did. that was what the accident, maybe that was the cause of the accident. Sure, but You know, it's very difficult to drive when you have one finger inside of your passenger's clothing and the other hand on the wheel, you know, sometimes you run a red light. Yes, exactly. But again, I mean, listen, I'm with you. This A form is either extremely poorly written or there's a lot of things missing that I'm very concerned about. 
and and there by the way you know again and i understand what the detectives or the officers here are trying to do they're they're trying to put as much information as they can because that's what they believe they're supposed to do but it's not necessary a lot of this could have referred to other reports a lot of this could have been summarized it didn't have to be because right now what they did is they locked into step by step word for word descriptions by this child and by the way ed you and i both have kids when your kid was 12 would they be able to to enunciate such a uh perfect description of such a traumatic event in real time without any problems without any you know i mean it just seems like she was telling a story okay but for the traumatic event, absolutely. My my daughter, when she was 12, would have been able to write a police report. However, I agree with you. Even I know that my daughter would not be this calm and detailed when such a traumatic event occurred. So, And, and just so we're crystal clear, because I said earlier, right, you don't want to be too detailed in your A-forms. Uh, so when I said they've left things out, the problem here is that because they're so detailed, it begs the question, why were you... Why? Right? about these other things exactly and so had they just simply con condensed this thing right yeah then what they do is fine the worst case scenario for them is ultimately they hand everything over to the prosecutor the prosecutor is going to get the audio recorded statements the prosecutor is going to get the interview room the prosecutor is going to get the recorded testimony of the child prosecutor is going to get the 911 call the prosecutor will review all this stuff that does not need to be in that police report Prosecutor reviews it all and says, all right, now I have to make a filing decision. And if I can prove this case, I need to tender all this to the defense. And that's when you want to lay it all out. But doing it the way that these guys did, again, I don't know. I mean, we're just reading a police report. We've never met this guy. We've never met this girl. We, we're not intimate with the facts and circumstances. But when we look at it, as we're doing now, we're assessing the four corners of the document. We're accepting every word in it as if what is written is true because that's how the document is supposed to be viewed for purposes of probable cause and bond. And we're saying, if it's true, should this guy be held with or without bond? I mean, now, look, he's he's looking at, at, at life in prison multiple times on, on these charges. And if he's guilty, he should get every day of it. Uh, but if he's not, and, and either way, whether he is or isn't, no good deed goes unpunished. And that poor kid is going to go through hell and high water because some defense attorney... Uh, un unless a deal is cut very early or they find out that she's a liar, uh, some defense attorney is going to have to shred her politely or not so politely. And as much as it, it pains me to say it, look at Trevor Bauer. We saw what had happened in Trevor Bauer, the Dodger pitcher. Right? Tell the folks. The guy, the girl, was they were dating whatever, apparently said that he had sexually beaten, abused her, beat her. And he got suspended from baseball, eventually got kicked out. This is a guy who won a Cy Young, who was really mm -hmm. doing well, had signed a $51 million contract, um, got in trouble. Then there was a civil lawsuit. And when the discovery started coming out, we find out now that she absolutely lied. She absolutely made the whole thing up, ruined well, the man's life. Again, things, you know, things happen, and this is why we have a justice system. And more importantly, this is why if you are ever accused of anything, you need a lawyer who really considers everything. Somebody who opens their eyes to the big picture as well as stays laser focused on the target. Right. It's what we call a global approach. And it's, it's what and, a responsible criminal defense attorney should do. And just to make sure that we end this, so we un uh, that's one of my, you know, let's again, let's be detailed. Um, it's very possible that this 12 year old lied. It is. It's very possible. However, you guys need to know something. In the state of Florida, if she lied about her age, that's not a defense. If she gave you a fake ID, not a defense. If you met her in a bar drinking alcohol, not a defense. Right. If she jumped his bones in the car, if she got in the car voluntarily. I mean, it may not be kidnapping if they can prove that. But if he laid a finger on her, he's done. In this case, in the state of Florida for these charges, well, not the kidnapping, but some of the other charges, the sexual battery on a minor. It is what we call strict liability. Doesn't matter what your intent was. Doesn't matter whether you knew she was a minor or not. The fact that you did it mm -hmm. makes you guilty. So it's another reason why you need to be careful what you say. And I think I talked about this on the show before. Remember, Michael? I had a client 
who I did represent because his girlfriend was 15. He met her. He was, I think, 20-something, just outside of the Romeo and Juliet. And now they were dating. Now they were boyfriend and girlfriend. But she had told him she was 19 when she was actually 15. And when, the, when daddy found out that she was having sex with this guy, he called the cops. Cops brought her in and said to him, did you know she was 15? And he said, she's 15. At least that's the way they wrote it. on the right, right. This is the My Cousin Vinny one. Right. That's how they, just like My Cousin Vinny. I shot the clerk. But I shot she, the clerk. He says that he said, she's 15. And they wrote it down like a statement. So it's another reason why I'm not trying to like tell pedophiles how to get away with things. What I'm trying to say is you got to be very careful because if a, if, if a 16 year old lies to you, you're still responsible. 15 year old. So now in this case, this girl's 12. Now there is the rare exception, right? There's maybe one in a million that you see some 12 year olds out there that look like they're 18 or 19 years of age. But I doubt seriously that this 12 year old looked like she was 19 or 20 years of age. Let me just recap what we, what we talked about real fast. Cause then we're way over time. But um, our first case, that arrest report, um, he's got problems. All right. I, I don't care what anyone says. Somebody throws a bottle at your car. If that bottle goes through the windshield or you, you're in a convertible and it hits you in the head and, you know, whatever, even then, I think you're going to be hard pressed to stop your car, get out of it, turn around and shoot somebody. But the driving away makes it even worse. Um, so, so that guy's got some problems. That was a well-written report. The second report that we read, uh, uh, the bomb threats, uh, also a very easy, clean arrest. Uh, I think that individual is going to have some problems, but. I see definite signs for a, a mental health, either defense or mitigation, and possibly, uh, as Ed alluded to, uh, diversion through mental health diversion court, potentially. I don't know. But certainly, I think mental health will have something to do with that case. The third one, excellent police work, but that's an ex a different type of case because that's one where they actually worked the case and did a complete investigation and, and made an arrest pursuant to a warrant with the assistance of an assistant state attorney. And then finally, this last one is a great example of the exact opposite. Uh, I'm not saying it's bad police work. I'm just saying that it probably was not the best police. It definitely was not the best police report we ever read. No. Um, and it gives a lot of fodder to a defense attorney uh, to, to think about grounds to attack, assuming that you can find one who's willing to attack the victim in that case. With that said, uh, I apologize that we went over today. I hope that it was interesting for you guys. I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the content. Ed, thank you very much. As always, your your insight and your uh, your experience as a prosecutor is is extremely helpful. Former prosecutor is extremely helpful. And uh, this was episode seventy seven. Well, hopefully, we'll see you next week on the twenty third for episode number seventy eight of At Your Service. Uh, when we get done here, our producers will upload the show to social media, and as soon as it gets uploaded to YouTube, I'll provide a link to everybody and make sure you have access to it. Uh, Ed and the folks at Miami Communities Newspapers, thank you very much. And to our audience, thank you very much. We appreciate the, the privilege of being able to be at your service. And we hope that we gave you some good information and some pro tips. And, uh, and hopefully you'll never need us. But if you do, you know how to find us. Take care, y'all. See you.